All right, well, welcome all of you. Thank you so much for coming this afternoon to the Norman Williams Public Library. Uh, I have no doubt that the vast majority of you know the people who will be speaking to you this afternoon. Charles Shackleton and Miranda Thomas, otherwise known as Wink, will be talking about their life and work. The title of their talk is A Life of Art and Adventure, an Illustrated Talk. And um, they are well-known artists and makers of a distinctive line of handmade pottery and furniture. And they'll be giving an illustrated talk about their life and work. Both artists are not only talented designers, but masters of the handmade. Shackleton Thomas is a Vermont-based company, as you know, and it is located in the historic Bridgewater Mill building. So without further ado, I give you Charles and Maritha. I'm just going to give you a little mini intro as to how this came about, because I'm the person who handed Miranda into doing this. <laughs> and first off, I want to thank Kerry and David and the Norman Williams Public Library for agreeing to uh, allow all this garbage into their hallowed halls. But, uh, but I think when you have a business, uh, you sort of get, you've got to get your story straight. And around here, there's been a lot of different stories. So we're trying to get the story straight. And I figured that if I set up like five talks around the Northeast for Miranda to give, by the time we gave the fifth one, which we're getting pretty close to, we'd have some sort of story, which hopefully one day will turn into something else. But anyway, just, just bear with it because it's, uh, it's an up and down ride. <laughs> Great. Off you go. We're married. Yeah. <laughs> Just so you know. And As so of this morning, you know. I'm going to pretty much wear my wife hat, I think, rather than my pottery business hat. And um, I've got my fact checkers here, my sister, Charlotte, and my father, David Thomas, who's 95, just had his 95th birthday. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> So um, it's a complicated story. It's not an elevator speech story, and I apologize. So the only way I could figure out to do it, and any input at the end would be really helpful to know if I could do it a different way or whatever, is that there's two of us in this game. It's not just one of us. And so um, there's a lot more than just us as well. But uh, what I did is I, I, I sort of telling Charlie's story up to Simon Pierce. And then I'm going to tell my story up to Simon Pierce, and then we're going to go off together, okay? <laughs> and there's a lot of images. I'm not a very good editor, so strap on your seatbelts. It's a little bit of a wild ride, okay? So um, I'll just wet my whistle, and then we'll go. So... I, I titled it Making Art an Adventure, and it's up to you whether you want to put a comma in there or not, but I've been taught you shouldn't put many commas into things, so I'm leaving it up to you. And it's the story of Charles Shackleton and Miranda Thomas. Miranda Thomas is sort of a, another alien being. I don't really know her. Um, <laughs> so this is Charlie's story. So Charlie was this very ugly baby that was born <laughs> in Dublin, <laughs> Ireland. Um, his uh, family home was just uh, a little way outside of Dublin, but um, the Shackletons were a tribe, and they were Quakers in Ireland, so they weren't only the 1% of, of Ireland, which is like the Anglo-Irish, they were the 1% of the 1% being Quakers in Ireland. And um, Abraham Shackleton in 1720 opened up schools in Ireland, and uh, this was in Ballytor, and it, they became famous as educators, and um, Edmund Burke was one of their uh, students. And then they got into flour milling. So this is the Shackleton Mill, which you can still visit today, which is along the Analiffy, uh, probably about seven miles outside of Dublin. And um, just up till about 30 or 25 years ago, his uncle lived here, but now it's being made into a museum by the Irish government. And George Shackleton was one of the great flour millers, and they did a thing called Lily of the Valley Flour, and um, it got sold out to um, Roma Spaghetti just so you know. But the, the Shackletons, they loved the country life, and they were really, uh, as well as flower millers, I think they gained in wealth, and they became 
really into horses, and so much so that Charlie's grandfather got into polo and blew it all, basically. <laughs> so um, they were the, what, what I call the white knuckle Irish. They were sort of hanging on to their wealth or hanging on to anything and living on cheese, basically, um, so they could stay in their home. But they still had the relic, the seagull, and it's still going today, which goes, uh, Jonathan, Charlie's brother, takes up and down the Shannon. But in the old days, the Shackletons all got together for their family holidays. As I said, they were a tribe, and they um, uh, had great adventures, and they had wonderful times. <laughs> and they were all, in, each in their own way, naturalists. And the most famous was, uh, Charles's family's cousin, Sir Anna Shackleton, who was the famous Antarctic explorer, and they have this family motto, by endurance we conquer. And he had the, one of the most incredible adventure stories where he got trapped in the ice. Um, he, he actually, one of the first uh, explorations he did was to go only 80 miles from the South Pole, and he turned back rather than perishing. And as he said, it's better to be a dead donkey than a, a, I mean a live donkey than a dead lion. And um, his next expedition was on the Endurance and it got trapped in the ice for two winters and it's one of the best and adventure stories ever told and that's another story, but I encourage you to read it if you can. So David Shackleton married June Rickards and this is their wedding and she was swept away um, by David Shackleton, and her father was Major General Rickards, and she was the ancestor, um, the uh, descendant of the economist David Ricardo, and her father was appalled she was getting married to David Shackleton, and he encouraged her not to, um, and she said, to hell with you, I want a life of adventure, so I'm gonna do this. And she stubbed her, her parents and she got married and moved to Ireland. And they lived in his family home, Beach Park, and there's the um, front hall with the um, sled of Shackleton hanging there. And it all seemed very rosy on the surface and there's our Bonnie Charlie on the side and dogs. <laughs> And these are his brothers, Jonathan and Arthur and Charlie in the middle and his sister Lydia. And it, it was almost like a farm, and, but they all lived around the garden. His father was one of the most famous plantsmen of Ireland. He had a two acre wall garden behind Beach Park with one of the biggest collection of perennial plants um, in the whole of Ireland. And he was the most uh, avid gardener. He used to go to England every year collecting plants and the other thing you should know about David is he was a tyrant. He was absolutely beastly, <laughs> uh, except for anybody who was interested in gardening. And then he was the most charming, wonderful man alive. And many women went off into the bushes with him. <laughs> he, um, <clears throat> this is David in the little corner. He was, he was such a, a ferocious plantsman that he could uh, judge uh, uh, at the Chelsea Flower Show and other things, exactly the, the best plants. And he was best known for his blue Himalayan poppies and salmesias. He, he studied salmesias, which are New Zealand daisies. And um, one was named after, it's not this one, called uh, Salmesia David Shackleton. And he also got named after this snowdrop, uh, David Shackleton. Um, Snowdrop. Now, the, the, as I said, this is the family, and Charles, by this stage, was um, older than seven or eight or nine, and he was already sent to boarding school at the age of seven, and as I said, it was a house of slamming doors. It was not a happy marriage at all. It was, um, David went off and had many affairs, and his mother was the British general's daughter and very stoic, and this unhappiness led to a lot of alcohol and a lot of nervous breakdowns. Um, and it was very rough on the kids, but they kept the kids out of it as much as they could by sending them off to boarding school. So Charlie was sent to Stowe School, which he caught the ferry from Ireland, used to take his sandwiches with him, and he used to once went into a restaurant to eat his sandwiches because he thought that's what restaurants were for, to bring your own food to and eat. <laughs> so he was out on his own, and in the, in the weekends, he would go to his fairy godmother, who was Valerie Finnis, who was one of the greatest gardeners of all time in England. She was a war girl um, uh, um, gardener who was specialist in alpines, and she married the other great gardener, 
um, Sir David Scott, who lived in this ducal palace in this massive, huge pile, and she lived in a tiny corner of it with a garden behind. And Charlie would help her in the garden all the time and got interested in grasses. But anyway, he would spend his holidays, whenever the family took a holiday, which was probably twice, um, to the west of Ireland with these incredible cottages and the doors left open and, and the people inviting you in for a chat and they lived with nothing and they, they had this incredible character. And when you think of Charles's furniture, you think of a mixture of the grand style and the cottage style. And, in the ho and on the weekends, he was always in the garden helping out, mainly repairing things like the greenhouse. And, but most of his time was, whether he's not in tree houses and in the plantation, he was in this ratty old workshop at the back and this was Charlie's workshop. I mean, it really did look like this. It was just a pile of, you know, stuff. And he loved making things with his hands. And he, uh, his first bookcase. And then this was his first big commission when he was about 17. And this is Simon Pierce's wife's home in Ireland. And she had hired Charlie's young um, brother at that time, who was just setting out as a garden designer, to... Uh, asked Charlie to make this trellis. So this is a, a big thing. So Arthur Shackleton knew Peer Pierce's mother. Does that make sense? Yeah. So Charlie, with three of his buddies, put a pin in the map and they decided that they were off to Iceland. They wanted to study the lichens and mosses on the glaciers of Iceland. And so they got everything out of the kitchen cupboard, wrote to every single company there, got all the money to get hiking boots and everything else. And uh, he got to go to Iceland. There was a little bit of a mutiny in Iceland. I think they voted him off. And he was no longer allowed to be captain of the three team. Um, there's a bit of a thing, but he was out mucking around. So this is Charlie mucking around in I Iceland. And then, <clears throat> and I haven't quite figured out how he got to this. Maybe that's something you can know. He suddenly started getting interested in refugees. So Charlie, at the age of 18, uh, joined a thing called the Ockenden Venture in Surrey in England. And they uh, were into taking Vietnamese and Tibetan refugees on holiday. So Charlie started a thing called the Beach Park Trust at the, that age, and he decided it was up to him to make sure that they were happy. And he took them to Ireland and took them to the west of Ireland, and he was extraordinary. And whilst he was at the Ockenden Venture, he started making pots. And these are Charlie's pots. And something happened just then, is he had a car crash, a serious car crash. He was going across a two-lane highway with his mother, trying to learn how to use a clutch, and he stalled the car in the middle of the dual-lane carriageway, and a Lamborghini was coming by and hit their car. So he nearly died, but he just, at that moment, he decided, I'm going to spend my life using my hands, because that's what I love, and I don't want to waste my life. So... He also fell in love with this girl in the Ockenden Venture, who's not me, and she was a very beautiful girl from Denmark. And so he called up his fairy godmother, Valerie, and said, I need to get to Denmark, big time. So she happened to know uh, an extraordinary man in, who worked for Carlsberg who had another pile in, um, in Denmark, and he used, needed somebody to rake the gravel in the front of the path for when the cars arrived. So Charlie was hired in the summer to come and rake the gravel. And he used to meet them in the kitchen and they'd sort of complain about the price of jam and things like that. And then they started talking to Charlie and he was saying that he was interested in farming but what he really wanted to do was go to art school but his father wouldn't allow him to go to art school. So they thought that was just a crime in Denmark. You, you don't not go to art school. And so um, they said, if you come back and work on the farm for three years, we are going to pay for you to go to art school. And this incredible family sent him off to near the Ockham Adventure, was one of the best craft art schools in England. And uh, Charles was one of the first people to go into the mixed media course. There's the wood, metal, ceramics, and glass. And when I knew him, he was always in the wood shop. And he was always organizing lectures and, and running the food co-op. But then suddenly he got involved in glass. And he, he really was good at ceramics, but he put himself into self-exile down in the molding department. I never understood that. Oh, yeah, then, so there was this cute surf chick who was at Farnham, too, who was also trying her hand at glass blowing. But that's another story. Anyway, so... <laughs> 
Suddenly at art college, I remember going up to Charlie and he said, well, I'm going off, I'm, not, I'm leaving college. And he said, like, why? And he said, well, I just want to learn glass blowing so bad. And my brother is really good friends with this guy, Simon Pierce. And I said, oh, I know Simon Pierce because I used to sell his glass in the craft shop in London. And he said, well, I'm going to go and I'm going to train and I'm going to learn how to blow glass and I'm going to learn how to make a living. And it's like, well, okay, fine. And he said, and then I'm going to immigrate to America because Simon said I can't <coughs> join unless I immigrate to America and I have to leave college to immigrate to America, but I have to work in Ireland for a year first. So Charlie went to work in Kilkenny in Ireland and um, they all thought he was a spy because he was from England, right? Sort of from England, he's Irish, but they thought he was Simon's spy. So it was not that pleasant. Now, the reason that Simon was sort of important is that Simon was part of the lineage of the arts and crafts movement, and his teacher was a man called Harry Davis, who was in New Zealand, and the reason he was in New Zealand is he was convinced that a bomb was going to drop on England, so he took himself off to him. He was a great potter and an intermediate technologist who made... Um, sort of pottery wheels out of refrigerators. And Simon was dyslexic, so they said he was thrown out of school at the age of 15. So his parents called up Harry, who they knew in Cornwall, and said, would you take our son? He said, absolutely. And so he was training Simon Pierce to be one of the great craftsmen of our time. And he was trained by a man called Bernard Leach, who was one of the forefathers of the pottery movement, craft pottery movement. So Simon having married Pia Pierce, uh, was up here having lunch with Lawrence Rockefeller, and, he, and they were looking for a hydro mill somewhere in the New England, and Rockefeller said to Simon, I think there's a little mill down the road, which was Queechy, and they went and looked at it, and it was perfect, so they bought it, and Simon started the hydro site whilst Charles was back training in um, Ireland, and then he was one of the only three glass blowers that came over with Simon in 1981. 81. So that was 30. Five. Yeah. So quite a long time. Oops, wrong way. So that is Charlie's story. Okay. <laughs> so now we've got Miranda's story. And um, mine's a little bit more complicated than Charlie's, so bear with me. <laughs> okay. <laughs> So this is me, and I um, was born in New York, okay? So this voice you're hearing is a complete fake, according to my sister. <laughs> anyway, so there we are, Charlotte and I on the, on the veranda, but we were born just outside of New York in, in a place called Sneedon's Landing, and um, our story goes way back to my beautiful mum, who was brilliant, and she was a poet, and she went to Oxford at the age of 16, and she was known as Poppy because she was born on Armistice Day. Her dad, who was um, elderly coming into childhood, had a great architect of the grand um, style, and he designed the Ritz Hotel. He um, married this uh, beautiful lady from Scotland who ran away to Hollywood when my mother was born, and that's another story. But um, this is Arthur, and this is, he designed the London Ritz. He did all the uh, interiors of the Queen Mary and the Aquitania. He did the lights on Piccadilly. He did the Royal Automobile Club. And it was um, an extraordinary life for my mother and her brother. But uh, she was sent away to boarding school again at about the age of seven um, to a school called Battle Abbey in Kent. And it was one of the first boarding schools to be taken over by the army during the war. So she was finding it terrifying to have all the troops coming in, getting them out of the school. They were billeted off to tutors. She was sent back to London and she was in the Blitz. And then she was sent back out into the country. So her, her memories were terrifying in the undergrounds with people, with, there was a man with a balloon and a balloon popped and it went bang. And, it just um, freaked everybody out. So she would never allow us to have balloons at birthday parties. Um, but then my mother at the age of 14 had a fellow come by and uh, he was quite a bit older than her, but um, 
uh, when she was about 18 again, she bumped into him again. He was this dashing, incredibly creative, gorgeous man. And that's my dad here. He was <laughs> a officer in the British Navy and he swept my mum off her feet. And he has, um, after the war, he came back and he decided to do what his father did. And his, his father, Harry Thomas, had gone to Japan at the turn of the war, I mean, turn of the century, and he actually went into the temple and became a Shinto Buddhist monk. And he came back out of the temple, married my grandmother, had two boys, and then my grandmother said, see you later, okay? So my dad went back to Japan and China. Things were rocky in China, jumped on a boat to San Francisco, ended up in New York State, heard about the Harvard Business School, and um, decided to go to the Harvard Business School. I read their love letters up in the attic in New York, and he wooed my mother from South Africa to come and marry him and move to Boston. Got that? <laughs> so here she is, stunning Annie, married to David, who was like Don or Dan Draper, whatever you call him. And then they had four bouncy Bonnie children in New York, and then he decided to move to Milan, Italy, because in Milan, um, the, the McCann Erickson, the advertising agency he worked for off <coughs> Madison Avenue, was expanding, and they needed somebody to help them run the Esso and the Procter and Gamble account. And so he um, was part of the team that put a tiger in your tank. Okay, <laughs> so um, the. We all had to go with him, thank God. And so there's Charlotte and I in Switzerland. We'd go along there. But one of my earliest memories of being at the American school in Milan was I was allowed to give this bouquet of flowers to the American ambassador's wife. And I was allowed to wear my mother's necklace. And I just, I had fur on my booties. I'll never forget that fur on the booties. And I just looked at that lady. She was the most glamorous thing I've ever seen in my life. And I just thought from that minute on, I'm going to be a diplomat. So, um, and in the summers, they took us uh, to a place called Montarache, and there was a glacier there. And we used to go walking all the way up to the glaciers, and I remember the flowers, just, they were just stunning, and I just bury my head in gentians and things. And then Dad took us to Venice, at the, and I remember at the age of five, um, going around Venice, complaining. There was far too much art. My mother was staring at so many paintings, but we went to the glass blowers, and I remember they gave us a little glass horse, and I never forgot that. It was just amazing. And then um, Dad got fired from McCann <clears throat> because he tried to get the Pope to sell soap. <laughs> <laughs> but that is another story, okay? It's a true story. And basically, the head of McCann decided he was going to, if David was going to meet the Pope, he was going to get the Pope to sell the soap. The Brazilian Catholic at the time, he brought all his family to also join him to meet the Pope. And it was a scam, and not my father's scam. He was scammed. And um, uh, the Pope was, it was children's mass, and they were little things amongst a whole crowd of people. So Dad had to move back to America. and. He always fished. My dad fished. So we always rented a little tiny cabin in Maine on um, the lakes around Sebago, and he taught us all how to fish, and I loved it. Then they bought a farm in Maine, and dad got involved with all the artists in New York. And he was instrumental in being the businessman with the EAT, the Tokyo Japan, the Experiments in Art and Technology. And they were like the coolest things out. And now they are again the coolest things out because they um, took computers, they took kinetic art, and they took rock music, and they did things called happenings. And one of the biggest happenings that happened in the 70s was the Japan Expo, the Japanese Expo. And Dad, because he had worked for Coca-Cola with McCann, had of course jumped to Pepsi. Smart. So Pepsi, he was instrumental in getting Pepsi to start collecting art. And so they did this art and technology out in Japan, and this was a Bucky Fuller dome that was so badly constructed that Dad's idea was to get a fog machine, and then it 
covers up all the, the <laughs> mistakes. And, um, and it worked. It was fantastic. And Bob Breer with things. So Bob Breer's friends were Andy Warhol, Rauschenberg, Oldenburg, and Frosty Myers. And they got drunk one night. And they doodled on something. And they thought, everybody's sending sh stuff to the moon. And the Apollo had landed on the moon. Let's put art on the moon. So dad, again, was ex absolutely instrumental. And they took this, this doodle here, which they edited here, because this was Andy Warhol's very naughty thing here, which I'm not even allowed to mention. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and there's Oldenburg's geometric mouse. And uh, I don't know, I think Rauschenberg did this line or something. They reduced it onto a silicon chip, and they got an engineer at NASA to weld it onto the leg of the Apollo 12. And there is art on the moon. And I don't know if you are, but that's another story. <laughs> Oops, sorry. OK, so um, Dad sort of went through quite a bit of money then and trying to launch a thing called Comet Can as well, where you put comics on cans, astronaut food. Anyway, he finally got a job, a wonderful job, called ST, um, with STP, the Racer's Edge. I don't know if you guys remember the stickers. And it meant that he, uh, we all had to get dressed up in racing car gear. And my dad had Dave tattooed across his, his left thing. And, we, and he said, we're all moving to Australia. And I was just 10 and a half. And Charlotte would have been about 13 when we moved to Australia. And my mother was amazing. She said, just think of the stars and the wombats and the kangaroos. And we were sort of like, oh, we were groovy chicks from New York. Anyway, we flew into Sydney, and it changed our, all our lives. Uh, Dad, I was very lucky, took me fishing to Tasmania, and I became a surf chick. We all became surf chicks, Charlotte included. She got more sunburnt than I did. Um, Anyway, but the thing that saved my life was when I was 16, I was learning Japanese. I started, the whole art department was turned into a pottery, and I started making pots. And I could do it. I couldn't believe it. And I was really excited, and I was getting more pleasure making pots than going to the beach. So something went off in my head. And I decided to really go at it. And art at college basically saved my life. Um, again, I didn't know who I was. I'd missed out on grammar, all my moving around. I just didn't know what was going on. And this, my art master, Ross McBride, who was pretty much six foot seven, um, he chose one student every year to come back to his art classes and join these three gentlemen to learn how to make pots. Now, these three gentlemen were interested in philosophy. And so we spent the whole time listening about these Japanese philosophers and English philosophers and pottery and the arts and crafts movement. William Morris, Michael Cardew, Bernard Leach, and Shoji Hamada. These men pretty much took from Victorian England uh, handmade things and made them valuable. They all stood up on podiums all around the world, wrote books, saying something is being lost by production. Something vital to the human being is being lost, and we must preserve it. And they all, in turn, set out to do an incredible pioneering thing. Um, Bernard Leach came back from Japan, set up in England. Shoji Hamada stayed in Japan, also went to England as well. And Michael Kardew went to Africa. Yanagi was one of the great uh, Japanese philosophers of the time and pretty much gave Japan back its identity after the war. So then Dad um, uh, decided to meet up with an old friend of his who was trading sheep with Iran. And so my father um, decided to join him. So this was dad's new venture, and it was called Ostiran. And they uh, had to figure out how to get 30, 300,000 sheep to Iran, live sheep to Iran. Is that correct? Pretty much. Two and a half million. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, it's a, a lot more. Um, it was a huge venture, and they, they constructed ships and everything to take the sheep out to Iran. Now, I want you to look at that date, okay? You know what's going to happen. Um, and Dad, at that stage, said, you've got to go to art school in England. He'd ship Charlotte off to Canada, my brother off to Canada, and I was going to go to Winnipeg, and then, I, and then they thought, no, it's better if you're learning pottery. Mum was totally into the arts and crafts movement. You should go to England, and I love pottery, so I didn't mind. And on the way to England, I was taken to Iran, 
And we were there for three and a half weeks and I got to see Isfahan. I got to see t on the road from Tehran to Persepolis. We had a flat tire, but that's another story. Anyway, and then I was, got into this incredible college called Farnham College of Art and Design, best known for crafts. Only 36 students taken a year and it was dismal. I just was expecting thatched cottages and rosy fences and it was this sort of place 35 miles outside of London. It was cold, it was damp, and it was like, oh, but I got interested by the springtime. I was recreating Roman kilns with dung and shipping the pots down the Thames, and it was exciting. And then meanwhile, Dad would come and scoop me up and saying, come on, you've got to come back to Australia and help me, or whatever. And so he would take me through Hong Kong. And back in Australia, my mum was very involved in the Aboriginal movement of, um, of preservation of their, their art and uh, also a lot of uh, beaches we knew were being mined um, and there were famous burial rites. So I went back in my second year, note the date, 1978, and I was a foreign student. So I moved into a house with another foreign student who is Denlami Aliu from Nigeria. And Denlami and I became best friends. And Danami had a tutor from Abuja in Africa who was working with Michael Cardew. And um, so Danami was brought over to England by Michael Cardew and he needed a BA so he went to art college. Michael Cardew called art colleges art hospitals, just so you know. So there I was, I brought them tea every day and I helped them chop the wood for the wood kilns and I helped them build the wood firings, asking them everything about Michael Cardew. And then Danlami said, Wink, just stop asking about Michael Cardew. Write him a letter and say you want to go and work there and fire the kilns. And so I said, I can't do that. He's a god. And they said, yes, you can. You must do it. And I wrote him a letter. And I got a letter back saying, yes, come. And it was just like that easy. I couldn't believe it. So I went down and there was another gentleman from England, um, Mark Hewitt, and a fellow called Thibaut Chagui from France. Now, these two are two of the most famous potters. He's in um, uh, North Carolina, and he, he's uh, always at the Smithsonian. And then Thibaut Chagui is in Paris, and his work is in the Louvre and in Paris, and he's amazing. Anyway, we lived with this old gentleman, Michael Cardew, and he was 81. He'd worked in Africa for 30, 40 years, and there I am. We lived around this table, and there was no, we never went away anything. Um, I went to London probably, I think, for two weeks once. I don't remember. Anyway, I lived in this room. I had very little on me. I was told not to bring anything more than a rucksack because he was frightened of girls moving in on him and doing housework. So I made sure I never did housework <laughs> and applied myself. We had to cut everything by hand. We had to make our clay by hand, everything. He was an intermediate technologist as well. And I learned to throw. And I learned to throw and throw and throw. And I put in my 10,000 hours. Uh, Thiobo had worked in a factory in France. So he taught me how to throw. So by the age of 21, I looked like a French truck driver. I was strong. Um, I could fire wood kilns. I could make clay. I understood what it was to cook with rocks. And um, I was really interested in what to put on pots. And everybody was talking about, you've got to digest the pots and you have to come up with your own style, your own thing. And how can you figure out who you are when you've been to all these places and you don't know who you are? And I thought I was Australian. I thought I was American. I just didn't know. And so Michael O'Brien, again from Abuja in, in Africa, would come to England and he'd take me and he'd, we'd talk about pots and we'd think about pots and him and Delami would keep working and so this is just a, a classic kiln fire and we had three big wood firings a year and then something miraculous happened in my life I fell in love with a farmer and he was the most incredible farmer and he rode around bareback and it was the most romantic time we we lambed thousands of views on Bodmin Moor and I was just like it was like Thomas Hardy and I live in this little <laughs> cottage and I'd go and fishing and he taught me how to hunt rabbits and we'd go and skin the rabbits and we'd pass them around in the village and it was just idyllic and it was wonderful and then we got all these New Zealand llamas to come to town and they um, she jumped into the uh, Land Rover between me and him and that was another story he gone he, he went to New Zealand with her so but I 
at that time, had really gotten to know the animals and their character, and I wanted, and of course fishing, I wanted to get that character into my pots. I was just, I felt like the medieval farmers, I'd lived in the cottages, they lived with their animals, they, were, they weren't drawing their animals, they were living with them, so when it came to putting the animals on pots, they weren't drawing on paper and then putting them on pots, they were just putting them on pots. So I decided I'm going to start just putting them on pots, but I realized I couldn't draw. Anyway, so my, uh, I wish I had a photo of my first birds had knees, I remember. They went that way. And then, um, and then I started drawing rabbits because I got to know their character so well when I was hunting them. And um, I think I, I got so many rabbits, I really started feeling horribly guilty. And my mum called it bunny revenge. <laughs> I have been painting rabbits and feeling guilty since. But I got to know them and I wanted to get their character into the pots. I wanted to get the bird's character. I wanted to get the fish. And I just started using my pots as canvases for brushwork. And Michael Cardew, at the age of 80, said, Wink, you have to go and work with my great scholarly friend, Alan Cager Smith. And he is the best decorator in the world. He works in Persian and Egyptian pots, but he has a pottery in Berkshire in England. I knew Alan, I knew his sons, and he agreed to take me for two years, but I had to promise him I would stay for two years. And I was, first time ever I was employed with Alan, I had a cottage across the street and um, I lived there and I worked in earthenware, which was a different temperature of cooking rocks. And I got to know a brush. So suddenly my rabbits and birds and things and my drawing skills got a little bit better and my fish started taking off. So then dad called me up and said, well, actually we're moving back to Boston, we're leaving Australia and you're in England, why don't you come over for a holiday? And it's like, ooh, yes, please. So I remember they paid for my flight and I, I went and I was all ready to set up my potter in England. And um, the only person I knew in New England, beside my friends from childhood years in New York, was this guy called Charles Shackleton, who decided to go immigrate with Simon Pierce. And then I also knew Simon because I sold his glass in London. So I decided to call him up and he said, oh, funny, I was dreaming about pots. And he said, um, come over. So, he, so I said, okay, I'll come over. And then Simon was opening a store in Keene. He said, I can't meet you. Anyway, um, that's another story. But we, I ended up visiting Simon Pierce. Simon hauled me up into the, um, uh, the apartment because Charlie said, I think I found a potter for you. And he said, but she doesn't have an American passport. So he'd already put two and two together that I worked for Michael Cardew, who was one of his sort of ilk. Um, and so uh, he said, yes, she was. She was born in New York. So I could work. So he came up to me and he said, I want you to start up the pottery for me at Simon Pierce as a business partner. And I didn't know anything. Anyway, we set up, Charlie and I, we both wrote each other into the script. Charlie figured out how to buy a home on the FHA, which is the Home Farm Farmers Association. And um, it was subsidized living because he was an impoverished glassblower and he set up a wood shop in the basement because this nagging girlfriend of his said, I remember you in the wood shop at college, not in the glassblowing shop. And he felt that Simon was doing everything that he'd want to do in glass. He was doing it just right, but he felt nobody was doing what Simon was doing in furniture. So he go down into the basement and my brothers and sisters bought him his first bandsaw and Charlie was away and to see Charlie really excelling. So he went to Simon and said, I'm going to work part time and I'm going to go and learn from this amazing furniture maker in Barnard who lived in Pomfret and that's Josh Metcalf. Mm -hmm. So Josh Metcalf taught Charlie how to use hand tools. So Charlie went down into the basement and he thought he was the bee's knees and he made Ta-da! These um, end tables. And he was so pleased. I mean, they were totally made by hand. So he called Simon up and said, Simon, come, you've got to come and look at these end tables. And Simon said, Charlie, they're awful. <laughs> they're really bad. They look like they're made by machine. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and, and he said, you know, there's no character in them. You've got to put character in them. 
And so Charlie went into this fit of some depression and he went off and read again, William Morris, Edward Barnsley, all about the hand. How can I get, he'd made them by hand. He couldn't figure it out. And then he looked at a Van Gogh painting and it was like a bingo. It's the planes of light. As the hand moves across, it leaves a facet that reflects the light. And if you take that facet away, make it dead smooth, it's dead. It doesn't have a liveliness the way your eye sees it. So he decided to go out and get a piece of wood from the, from the bit of hickory from the woodlot, and he just went at it with spoke shapes, and he made this stool, and it was, again, a, an epiphany. It's like, oh, that's it. So then he was rabid to go and make some more furniture, but he didn't have any money to make any, uh, buy any wood, so he decided to mill up the deck of his house. <laughs> so we didn't have a deck, but we did get a splendid cupboard that he was going to put in, and a friend from New York came up and said, oh, Charlie, I love that cupboard. He goes, well, it's going to hold my tools in the basement, and they said, no, it's not. It's coming back to my house. How much is it? And Charlie said, $800, and it was like a king's ransom, and she said, yes, please, and that was Grace Knowlton, and she bought his first cabinet, and then Charlotte, my sister, came up to Charlie and said, I want a bed. And he went, ooh. So he designed what he called the Queechy bed and called Simon again. And Simon came trotting over and said, I love it. Let's put one in the showroom. So that's what happened. Oh, by the way, Beach Park burnt down, just so you know. That's <laughs> another story. But this happened when Charlie took me back home to meet the family. We had a, an incredible party um, for all the people around to welcome Charlie home. And the house burnt down. So um, we got to know each other pretty good during that time, and then Charlie decided to propose, which was jolly nice. And we um, went back to England to get married in my cousin's, uh, father's cousin's place, and they were the Clarks, and they invented desert boots, but that's another story. So this was him helping me across the barbed wire where we had to go and have our photos taken on of bridge that she had built for us, and it was kind of silly. But anyway, so um, by that stage, Simon Pierce and the pottery had really uh, got going, and I was um, not making any money. I was only making $5 an hour at that stage, and I told Simon, because everything was being plowed back into the business at that stage, and I said, look, just pay me a wage. Forget it. Um, I just I, I, I want to go home and um, make pots. And he was saying, we've got to start wholesaling. And I didn't know if I could handle making that many pots. So I just became his consultant and employee to go and train a huge team of people in my designs. Um, and it was called Miranda Thomas Pottery at that time. And Simon was learning about brand. And none of us knew about brand. We were just making, and I was making. I didn't even know I was designing. And there was this whole thing, was, are they your designs? Are they Simon's designs? It was very tricky. But his, the advice he was getting is that he really couldn't have two brands within his brand. So he had Charles Shackleton Furniture, who was selling all that in the mill. And he was having Miranda Thomas Pottery also within this brand. And so it began to get complicated. But this is what we built up in his barn. Um, out on Clay Hill Road, and it was a, it, we had 10 potters selling nation, nationwide. We were selling all over the place. I would go to Italy all, uh, a lot, and I came up with a great pattern um, beyond the fish and the bird and the rabbit. And Jeff Pentland joined me from England, and we just started making ferocious amount. And I was freshly married, and I wanted to have children, and I got what you call burnt out. So I wanted to go home and garden, and I went and bought myself. I had hardly any money, but I bought $360. I bought this kiln from a lady in Plainfield, and she said, mark my words, you're pregnant, you're going to have a child, you'll never use that kiln. That kiln has had over 300 firings. It's an amazing kiln. Anyway. It's still going, you know. Exactly, and this was Charlie's big break. Um, he, Simon had asked him to make a garden bench, and of course he knew the proportions and things to make garden benches because of his dad. So he made this garden bench, and um, a lady from the Chicago Botanic Gardens called him up and said, oh, we've just been told that you make garden benches. And his mum answered the phone, who was visiting from Ireland, and she said, oh, yes, yes, he makes garden benches. And so she said, Charlie, there's somebody from the Chicago Botanic Gardens on the phone. So Charlie ran down to the basement, turned on all the machines, so it sounded really busy. <laughs> and he 
<coughs> said, yes, we do make garden benches. And they said, well, we've got Lister, we've got all these people, and we hear that you make from Simon Pierce these handmade garden benches, and we'd like you to submit designs, and we'd like to fly you out on an airplane and pick you up in a limousine. And so Charles was like, great. And we had a little baby, and he got the bid for 200 something garden benches, starting with 25. So, you know, hallelujah, we were just so happy and he needed to start making them. So he hired a young man from Earlham College, Nico Brooks, and he borrowed, uh, hired a Dennis Dukoff and Nate Brown and they set in earnest making these garden benches as well as all the furniture that Simon was selling at, at Queechee. And there they are at Chicago Botanic Gardens and Charlotte, they've ordered how many benches now? 280? So every time somebody drops dead in Chicago, you get a garden bench. <laughs> and then we were, Hugh was born in 1990. We decided that we needed more space. And so um, a friend of mine in New York was an architect. And Charlie thought, well, why move out of this place when there's a good septic and all these things? So let's just take the roof off. So we just took the roof off. There's Boz Boswell, um, uh, Buzz Boswell there. And uh, everybody took the roof off. And then Charlie decided to go to Ireland. And I had a big blue top and it rained. I mean, it was a disaster. But anyway, <laughs> we put another roof on. And then the house in Queechy just kept going up in value. So we were able to borrow money against it to get the business going. I decided to move into the basement. I'd left Simon Pearson consulting at that stage and Sophie and Hugh were growing and I moved in and Charlie was still doing a little bit of stuff downstairs. And then all the, the employees of Simon Pierce helped me build this uh, shed out the back in Queechy and I had to come up with different designs that I did at Simon. So I went into the black carved pieces um, because everywhere I went, people said, oh, well, we have Simon Pierce. Why would we want your pots? And it's like, but those were my pots. <laughs> so I had to come up with a different range. So that was hard to do with little children and trying to figure it all out. But meanwhile, Charlie was powering. Simon had opened 12 stores and selling all his furniture. And he was selling close to $2 million worth of furniture. <laughs> and he had needed to train furniture makers and he needed somewhere to make the furniture. So he, um, moved out of Barnard and he uh, bought at that same real steel, the Bridgewater Mill, the West End. And everybody started making. We built it up to 29 furniture makers. Charlotte, uh, my sister, decided to come and move to Vermont from being a hydro consultant. She decided to change her life and loved what she saw and, and loved skiing. So she came up and became our business manager and we built it up to 29 furniture makers, but it's still making everything by hand. Now, if you do math and everything, it's almost impossible to make money doing anything by hand, unless you're selling direct. We weren't, we were selling through Simon Pierce and other stores. But we also had started the pottery and growing the pottery and Veronica DeLay and Fiona Davis moved in and helped me in my basement. And this building came up for sale in, in Bridgewater and we decided to gun it and, and get it for the pottery, open two apartments that paid the rent for the pottery. And then everything really took off. We just started making. We were a powerhouse of making. Charlie, ref looking back to those cottages in Ireland, used that as an as influence for his cottage chairs. Also a little bit of Morris, uh, William Morris in that design. The, the, in the mill in Queechy had these old traditional Irish forkback in chairs in, in Ireland. Ireland. Sorry? In it's Ireland. Really in Ireland, sorry. Um, his, it is uh, uncle's flowers in the garden, influencing his designs, going to Italy and seeing these incredible scrolls and things. And the cottages full of these just incredible characterful pieces and Charlie's impersonation. Uh, in, influences coming through crazy beds, you know, glamorous beds, beautiful things, Vasari's desk in, in um, the Uffizi, I mean, um, Arezzo and the Vasari's. And you'll notice that everything has carving. And the reason is you have to go in a mechanical age to where the machine can't go. So you use your hands and then you have character and more design. Sorry, I'll whip along. 
Then we bought Grand Mams Hill in 1999, um, which is way at the top of Bridgewater, and we have this incredible view, and it's very like the Irish cottages, and still making, um, but we had become a retail company by that stage, and um, it was doing some of our best work then. It was amazing. The pottery team was incredible, um, making porcelain, stoneware, um, and, uh, it was 1999, and I decided that it was, I heard on the radio, because we're always listening to NPR, that it was the longest America had been at peace. So I decided to do um, peace doves for Chicago that year, and they're most appalling peace dove. I don't know what I was thinking, but I decided to send it to President Clinton, because it was almost the millennium, it was the buzz, and I decided it was up to him to keep the peace into the millennium. And I wrote him a letter saying, please accept this made by American hands out of American soil as just a humble pot, but to, to charge you with keeping us in peace. And I had a friend who knew the chief of protocol. And so the chief of protocol said, yes, we will take it into President Clinton if we think it's appropriate. They read the letter, they thought it was appropriate. And the next thing you know, I got a phone call saying he's got it, he's taken it into his apartment. So I um, got a, a pot to Clinton, and we had the address of the protocol lady. So a year, that year, we sent an invite to the um, open house, and this turquoise and gold pot uh, was on the front of the postcard, and they rang, suddenly the White House rang during the open house and said, we want 16 of these turquoise for their Middle Eastern tour to give Netanyahu and people. And Charlotte and I ran around and we found everything we could, but all we could find were other things. And they said, that's fine, anything symbolic. We sent a porcelain pot. We got another phone call from the White House saying, we need you over Christmas to make a porcelain bowl with a, a, a peace dove flying from the east, I mean, from the west to the east. And you have to get it done in six weeks. And I said, I can't, it's the holidays. There's no way I can do it. And they said, I don't think you understand you have to do it. <laughs> and it was sort of like, oh my God, what am I gonna do? So I ran up to Charlie and he said, Wink, you have to do it. And it's like, okay. And they said, the reason you have to do it is because it's his personal gift to Pope John Paul II. So it's just like, oh. So that afternoon I ran downstairs and I made six bowls with R. Cardew who had joined me already at the pottery. That's Michael Cardew's grandson. And we made six bowls and they all warped uh, except for one, and it was heavier at the bottom, but it made it through, oh my God, just the relief. I've never done anything so scary in my life. Then, as these things happen, a couple of years later, Kofi Annan was coming to the end of his term, and I got a phone call from the United Nations Association of New York saying they needed a peace bowl like I'd given, uh, or Clinton had given, to give Kofi Annan. So again, oh, so, I made two, they couldn't decide on the design, whether to have a gold band or whether to have two peace doves going, and it just went back and forth to New York, and finally we came up and we got the thing, and then I was invited to actually help present it to him, and that was just staggering. And then the next year, they called again saying, well, we need to give something to the new Secretary General, Ban Ki-moon, so it was the water was the theme, and so there's the, the head of Rotary here and another ambassador, and I had to present the bowl to Ban Ki-moon, and that was kind of scary. And then the next year, they called up and they were giving Norman Foster a thing, and they needed a white vase because he wouldn't have any. Anyway, that's another story. And then my mum, uh, was working on my grandfather's ar archive in London and all these buildings were 100 years old. So we um, had to make a bowl for the Royal uh, Automobile Club and present that. We had to make a bowl for the Ritz in London. And then I got a phone call from the White House again and it was uh, um, Barack Obama uh, office or the new pr chief of protocol saying we need a pot for uh, Biden to take to the Vad Hashem in Israel. And... Um, so this pot here was sent to the Vad Hashem in Israel, and Obama had one uh, that the lady who was the go-between had already given his office, and he wanted one just like it. And so he actually sent the bowl back that was in his office for me to inscribe, and then they sent it on, and I had to make him another bowl to go back in his office. <laughs>
So, and then uh, the other thing that happened, we got another phone call from a thing called the Lumba Foundation, which worked with all the widows of the world to make Widow's Day um, on the calendar at the UN. And Yoko Ono was a big part of that. And so I'm very proud to say there is uh, Widow's Day now on the calendar at the UN. And then Charlie went to Antarctica and he took my car keys with him. And that's another story. <laughs> So then, <clears throat> and then um, the head of Dartmouth called up and they needed to have a plaque to uh, represent all the people that were killed in 9-11. Uh, and 9-11 was so shocking because everybody just closed, um, they're just closed down. And, you know, it was, it was hard when Simon Pierce said, you guys go out on your own and we turned it around to a whole tale. But when 9-11 happened, it, it shook everybody. And it, it took all our might to, to learn to do um, brass plaques and things to get this through. Charlie designed these garden benches and this wonderful memorial garden was built just between the inn and um, the Hopkins Center. And as you know, it doesn't exist anymore because it's a hotel. Right, so I don't know where that is. But we were ready to grow again after quite a few years of, of really um, people closing down and again surviving, making really beautiful things. And then Stowe Mountain Lodge opened, they sit in wooed us to open a store there and we decided to move from Woodstock to Hanover. Now, see the date? At that stage we thought, oh, that's good, the kids grown up, we're feeling good, it's sort of things are beginning to take off again. And then 2008 happened and again everything shut down and then Sophie decided to go to Africa uh, to Mali and um, I was lucky enough to go and uh, see the potters and meet the potters there and they inspired one to go right back to clay just think about clay and then came, came home and the flood right down again um, that's at Simon Pierce and this is the road at the mill this was my pottery um, and Charlie's basement, and uh, it was incredible. All the pots had survived, um, but the kilns hadn't. The, the mud was every Audi was from a refugee from um, Albania, and he just, this didn't phase him at all, and he was the saint of the flood. He was extraordinary. Everything had to come out, buckets. This was the roads up to Grandmam's Hill, completely wiped out. And Hugh and Carolyn would walk in and um, we'd all meet each other and Charlie would have to get everything out. The whole community came out and helped us. Um, Surf Pro had to come with their ex-cons and clean out all the things. And it was just bucket by bucket and Charlie was extraordinary. And I had the rare chance of going with this extraordinary group from England to go to all the porcelain cities of China. And Charlie Blossom just said, go, go you've got to go. And it's like, no, I can't go. And he goes, go. So I ran away to China. And this is one of the great dragon kilns going up the hillsides. These huge things, it just blew my mind. This is Jingdezhen, the porcelain city where all the traffic lights are made out of porcelain. The garbage back cans are made out of porcelain. Everything's blue and white porcelain. I went to Dehua, which Blanc de Chine, the greatest porcelain in the world is made there. And saw these people hammering the porcelain by hand. And I went to visit this place where these young men were training to draw dragons on pots and they suddenly just saw me watching so much that he passed the brush to me and he taught me how to do dragons. So they're my dragons and I'm teaching him the scroll all on this enormous pot. And then <clears throat> the group tricked me into drinking snake wine. <laughs> and so the influences of China began to came, come through. Charlie wanted to make things directly from the forest, and so he came up with the Naked Table Project where people could put their own labor and cost into making their own tables, and the Naked Table Project was born. It was f the most phenomenal thing for sustainable woodstock, and, and I hope if you guys haven't done it or haven't done it, you will go, Cecilia's here, she's poster child, and um, Sally Miller has just been extraordinary in, in getting all this going, and, um, it, all the volunteers in town. And Charlie goes off on these little tangents, and so he decided he wanted to learn how to make a loaf of bread from his own wheat, and he discovered it's the, the size of your patch has to be that of a queen-size bed, so he built and grew his own wheat and wanted to make his own flour, but it snowed. But anyway, there I am putting 
wheat on the thing and then I decided I couldn't make big enough pots so I went and just got some canvases and decided to start painting on canvases. Um, and then this is this uh, thing I just started painting on canvases like I do pots. Charlie keeps on coming up with new designs but what our huge focus is we have to sell the stuff. You have to just get it out there and Vogue picked up on his bed which is very exciting and our daughter is off on adventures. She went and did the Edinburgh Festival this year with her friends um, and they were tall women in clogs and then our son Hugh Shackleton now who's also a designer has been working. He's joined the company um, and this is the view and it's always inspiring and my latest obsession is watercolors. I just and I'm, I'm obsessed. And then we've got young people, Asbian from Denmark, the family that sent Charlie to art school, is now an architect, and he's been helping us uh, with some things. And Ross, who's a friend from theater, is going to be helping us with the rest of the team to new adventures. This Samuel Pepys has just been made, and it's moving into the Woodstock in tomorrow, correct? So you can, based on the great collector, Samuel Pepys, who is a diarist, and so Charlie adapted the design for the newspapers in the Woodstock Inn. And um, this is our newest adventure, and I'm telling you now, I don't think anybody knows, but we're thinking of opening a store, a pop-up store in Brooklyn in about two weeks. So this is gonna be in Cobble Hill between Brooklyn Heights, and um, this will be the Shackleton Thomas store in this building here and it's all pretty scary so whenever we can we retreat back to our own garden look out at the view and just um, go by our motto which is also Shackleton's which is optimism is true moral courage so that is my talk and um, thank you Here goes, guys. I mean, who knows? You know, sink or swim, up, down, whatever happens. It's just you got to go for it, and we think we got to go for it. So, um, I encourage you to ask questions. And anyway, Charles. Yeah. So I'm just going to give you because this is all meant to be about art. Uh, there's one common thread that goes through our work, and um, thanks to a writer's course that was held here, we given by Margaret Edwards. Uh, I've actually written a little pamphlet which summarizes what I'm just about to say. But obviously you heard through that theme that um, we are interested in handwork. And when I grew up, uh, and it's sort of we're around the people I grew up, handwork was looked down upon as menial. We obviously believe differently. When people buy a pot or a piece of furniture, normally people look at three different things. Uh, one is they look at the design. Two is they look at the materials, and three, they look at the craftsmanship. So those are the three major items that you would think about. The, the number three item, which is the craftsmanship, is a very confused subject. Because craftsmanship is really, in, in my mind, it is the skill with which it's made. And you can get uh, an incredibly skillful craftsperson in the hills of Amman, or you can get a factory in China and they can make it very often equally as well. And by the way, equally badly in either case. So from, from my point of view, it is really the craftsmanship piece is just the technique with which it's made. We have a thing which we've sort of labeled the fourth dimension. And that is really what we are all about. And that is to do with how the human uh, being integrates with that object. And it's the only way I can describe it is, is it's a little bit like the difference between a print, such as that Van Gogh print of the, did we have it? Yes, we did. Mm -hmm. the slideshow. Mm -hmm. The difference between the $4 print, which we've got back in the workshop, and the original, which happens to be worth, last time I looked, about 70 to 80 million. Now, that's a big difference when you're just trying to put some color on the wall. Now, the 70, why the difference? 
in the seven to eight million dollar frame. You can feel, painting. see, what? painting, painting. Mm -hmm. uh, you can see and feel the work of that person. You can actually connect with that person. And I guess what we, and it's a little bit also like when a grandchild gives a grandparent a card uh, at Christmas, you know, they have a choice between Hallmark or one they do themselves. Well, you know which one the grandmother prefers is the one done by hand, uh, by their grandchild actually done by them. And so we look upon these objects that we make as like, they're just immaterial objects, you know, they're just there, what is that famous quote? Uh, what is it that puts life into an inanimate object? For is that not what man is? In other words, it's a collection of bones and materials. But when people come to Bridgewater and they buy things from their store and they have a good time, they're having a nice time in Vermont and they get to know us, they're basically buying these mugs or tables. They're like messages. They bring them home to wherever they live. And they're like little icons which represent the life that they believe in. And if those objects, you can see the thumbprint of the potter or, you, or the painted work on the, on the pot or you can see the hand carved details, that brings those things to life. And that is really what, I haven't, the, the brochure, the, the thing that we printed does a better job of describing, but that is really what we are about, is these objects are like messages of a, of a lifestyle and a life that we all believe in. Um, and so I think that is, I don't know whether I quite covered it. Well, there's that many is times common. people have asked us to make more and more and mechanize, mechanize, mechanize. And we, we have to be very careful to wear the hand. You know, where is that point that it's too far? And we're we constantly get, double checking. We get place. customers coming into our store. And we, we mostly, our work is classic design. We like it being classic because that is the most understood design language that is that covers all the spans of centuries. It is classic, but we get people walking to our store and they come and tell us they, they get a feeling that somebody made it. And when we, when we hear that, we know we have achieved what our goal is, that these objects are things that people will put in their home that will make them feel at home, if you will, surrounded by things that they love. But also the most important thing now we have to do is make sure those skills that those guys taught us are passed on. Mm -hmm. So we have to keep going to make sure that we get the next generation. Because we've been doing this for a whole generation, 30 years mm -hmm. this year. Mm -hmm. so, but people um, think we are really furniture makers come to a shop and they see the way we make furniture. They think we're completely out to lunch, and there is no way that you could make any money with a product, right? Uh, making, <laughs> but we use those handles. There's two things we do. One is generally a person will make a piece of furniture from beginning to end themselves, so that they imbue that piece with their personality. And the second thing that we do is we use a lot of hand tools. And the reason we use hand tools is that the human is unable to control those tools perfectly, unlike a machine. So you will get very slight variations in the work, which it almost gives the object a vibe that the customer or the person who receives it can sense. And so and it, that is to do with the personality of the designer and the maker. So we, those are two very important things. And we encourage things. people to come in and feel the furniture all the time. So not the staff, but the furniture. <laughs> so it's a very, it's a very, you know, when I, I'm a member of the Guild of Vermont Furniture Makers, and when I tell them about hand work and the use of hand tools and explain why it's so important, they, they mostly think I'm completely out to lunch uh, and they, they don't get that piece. But my thing is, if you're going to be competing with restoration hardware and IKEA and all these factories, you better have something, if you're, and you're going to work on your own making these things, you better be able to express your individuality through those pieces. Because that IKEA and restoration can't do. We think that we've been begun at least to define what gives something life. So that's the end of it. And everyone's welcome to have all these. And questions. I'd just like to say thank you to one really important person in this room, and that's my dad.
because he believed in women going out and working, going to college, being educated in Australia in those days. Not depending on men. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but he, as soon as he and my mum learned that I wanted to be a potter, they didn't try to have me go the other direction. They got the bellows out from the fireplace and they just started bellowing. And <laughs> you just have been one of the greatest supporters, Dad, and I just want mm. to thank you. So, there we go. There's lots of donuts. So, um, thank you. Is there any question? Does anybody have any questions? Yeah, David. Wait, how does the artist cope with the pressure to become a production shop? I think we trained as production artists. So we aren't commercial artists. We're not studio artists, we're production. So I call myself a production potter. That is what my skills are, is I know how to make runs of things between one and 40 to 100. I can't make thousands. I can't make even 104, you know, I, that's pushing me. But I can make runs of about 100 um, maximum and the thing is, is that then I can be a part of the whole process. I can go and load kilns, I can make glazes, I, and I don't get injured. I don't get carpal tunnel syndrome. If I was making thousands, I would be really not, I would be a cripple. So I don't want to answer the question. So if somebody <laughs> came to you and said, I want a thousand benches. Yeah, I'm, I'm answering this question. <laughs> We'd say yes. <laughs> <laughs> but I'll tell you, there's a couple of things. When you make things by hand, they're expensive. And therefore, generally, the people who buy our work understand what they're buying. Also, because of that philosophy that I talked about in that booklet and why we printed it up, we will not compromise that philosophy. Because the minute we do and the minute we cheapen our product, we are competing with the masses and we're done for. So we entertain jobs. I can tell you, every day, people saying, do you want that many? Someone called up looking for 15 thousand dollars worth of beaker cookie jars for Oreo cookies and we said there's no way we can do it for less than 120 dollars a piece and, but we could do it you know we will do it and we but we don't often get off of that because of the cost of it but we can we can right we can no we can we can do it or we can find somebody else to do it for us if necessary here's a question it's yeah hard. you gave myself and seven friends a great tour in march when they were visiting me and i saw all four floors uh do you yourself still make some of the furniture or i try really seen? hard and it's been really hard thinking about this Brooklyn store because it means basically that I've got to throw my life into making sure that Brooklyn store works and I thought I guess I'm going to be a businessman for the next few months but we have incredible craftspeople who've spent 25 years of their whole life there you wouldn't want a piece of furniture from them. <laughs> but that will be that'll be when I uh, Okay. when things calm down and everything's going well. That's my goal, but it hasn't. Oh. But I do occasionally. But believe me, when, when things, you've got enough sales in the door to pay everybody's wages, Charlie yeah. does go into the shop and he's designed the coolest thing. It's called the performing chair. So I encourage you all to come over to the workshop and see Charlie's performing chair. <laughs> yeah. It lights up. <laughs> question? This is a question for Wink. Yeah? Where was here, or is it? the origin of your name, Wink? This guy. I had a friend from, um, uh, who was a Navy guy, who came to my christening, and he peered into the cot and said, it's not a Miranda at all, it's just a little Winky. Mm -hmm. I'm called babies and, babies and fairies, Winkies. Winkies, so yeah, I became Winky, Charlotte became Missy, Miss Mouse. So we are Missy and Winky, but we're Miranda and Charlotte. <laughs> and um, when I went to Australia, everybody wanted to call me Mandy or Myra or something, Randy. Um, so I wanted to be Wink. So I sort of became a dual personality of Wink and Miranda. Miranda was good, Wink was naughty. <laughs> um, so it sort of stuck and then when I came to town everybody said, Charlie kept calling me Winky and everybody else started calling me Winky and now I thought people in New York call me Winky. I mean everybody calls me Winky. So you're all welcome to Winky. <laughs> Does that answer your question? Yeah. Any other questions? I have one. Would you like one? Good. Well, I enjoy, do go and enjoy some refreshment. And, uh, anyway, I'll sleep once more.
Thank you so much. Thank you so much for your